Well, good day, everyone, and welcome back to the Cyber Minutes podcast. My name is Max, and I'm joined today by Flynn and our special guest, Christina. So, hey, Christina, how are you going? Going very well, thanks, guys. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. Good. Thanks. So, Christina, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, like where you work and what got you into cyber? Yeah, absolutely. So, I I guess the first thing, what got me into cyber, um, I am part of the generation, probably the last generation, where cybersecurity wasn't anything that you studied at uni and there wasn't really as formalized known courses to do. So, you sort of just fell into it, starting a career in IT, moving around different types of roles. I did project management, business development. And it wasn't until I was sort of working in the UK in the privacy space that I then shifted into cybersecurity, um, learning, you know, picking up modules, having a read of news articles, understanding from industry experts and sort of building that knowledge as I went, um, which led to my partner and I actually started a cybersecurity startup over there. And I was not the mind behind it all, but I was the everything else person, which really gave me an opportunity to learn so much about it. Um, and then it, it, you just keep getting the next role, the next role, um, until you kind of really do end up having quite a career in cybersecurity without even realizing it. So therefore, at the moment, um, I am actually working on my own business, I'm hoping to really build it up. It's called Inspire Cyber. And I'm focusing on approachable cybersecurity training for humans. And I've worded that very specifically um, because I really do think there is a diverse range of people and we know that everyone needs to know cybersecurity. It's everyone's responsibility. So I'm really focusing on catering training to people in a way that they're going to receive it the best to make it most effective, not just, you know, click through a mandatory module that you just want to get to the end and answer the questions. So that's what I'm working on at the moment and I'm loving it, which kind of brought me here to you guys and sort of sort of the work that I'm doing. Awesome. Yeah, I was about to say actually that sort of what training do you find to be effective and what's ineffective? I completely agree that e-modules are just so crap a lot of the time. Um, a lot of companies I see that do e-modules, um, that it's it's who gets through it the fastest. It's either that or you're chasing people up to try and get through it because nobody's done it. Um, yeah. For that reason, I always recommend in-person training. But what do you... Um, what training do you think actually works? Yeah, so in person, absolutely. That's the number one. I don't think you can ever replace that. Um, in person training, you have the opportunity to sort of the concept teach from the back of the room. So they can teach themselves the concept and you can facilitate. And that really means that they comprehend the concept that you're delivering. So that's by far the best. Um, with the online modules, I feel like that's a catch 22 because you need them for compliance purposes yes right and a lot of people do them purely for compliance purposes which is fine but you also have a hundred other departments that need compliance modules and i think part of the problem with our online modules is that we deliver like 45 at the same time to the same person mm -hmm. and if it was if there was separate i mean actually i was going to say if there were separated but when you have that many how on earth do you manage that schedule so that's a really tough i think there is a place in a space for online modules Possibly like micro learning is taking off at the moment where they're like two to three minute video styles delivered at, you know, more frequent um, schedules. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's one of the solutions there. Um, but absolutely, your face-to-face, -face, you can't replace it. It's, uh, that's what I like to focus on the most, but it is more expensive. So I can see yes. how organizations are trying to balance, you know, the costs involved when it comes to securing an organization. Um, not just that, but a lot of companies are remote. You know, we had COVID. People went remote. We like remote. Yep. Um, a lot of big companies work remotely really well on different time zones. So they share the load. So it's not just about we can't get people in a room, but they're not even in the same time zone. So I think we have to accommodate for that too. And that's where those online modules can be more effective yeah. or at least complement, I should say. Yeah, I think there's yeah. sort of a right way and a wrong way to go about it. Exactly like you said, mm -hmm. I find that you know, some of the ones that I have to do for my company, if they're really, really long, it stops going from, okay, I'm interested and I want to try and pick apart and learn every single little part of this to just, uh, I'm going to remember the key points and then just like put them in the quiz at the end. Like it, yeah. it's less of a, it's less of a learning experience and more of just like a, a task to do to check. Yeah. Box. Get it done. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Some of those quizzes though, I've seen some quizzes and I'm like, I don't know if I think too hard about the answer and I'm too technical then I'm like, but both of those could technically apply if you, and then 
And so I do think some of the quizzes I've seen, we need to pay a little bit more attention. And this is from sort of the platforms that do the training to the quality of those quiz questions and the nuances that come with it. But that's just a personal opinion. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So how, just sort of leading off that, how are some techniques or some ways that you can see us sort of improving cybersecurity a little bit more generally? So not just the modules, but also just in general, what are some techniques that you've seen that could uplift the industry sort of as a whole and yeah. how can we kind of incorporate or weave education into that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually actively working on this at the moment. Uh, and this is because I'm a big believer in this middle layer of cybersecurity knowledge. So not the top layer, which is phishing simulations, strong passwords, MFA, don't go visit this website, that sort of thing. Not the cybersecurity at the bottom, so layer three, which is for cyber people, and that's quite technical, that you know goes into the weeds, but this middle layer of every other business role in an organization who accesses multiple applications, multiple systems, deals with customers, deals with vendors, and they're not going to be cybersecurity people, but this engagement that they have means they need a better understanding of how systems work and then how to protect those systems with the way that they work with them. Um, now, for this reason, I love to, I mean, I'm actually delivering a course at the moment, which is two days, which focuses on that cyber fundamentals. So it's literally every cyber domain at a level, um, not too deep, but high enough for them to comprehend that cyber business relationship. You know, what is vulnerability management? And what does it mean for you when that is brought up? You know, um, I think you guys were mentioned before you're doing BIAs. Oh, I have been, yeah. Which yeah. So there's yeah. lots of people um, involved, like uh, in the different domains, and the cyber team goes out, and, like we have to work with them, but they don't know any of the terminology. They don't know, well, not that they don't know, but sometimes we assume that they know too, and the waters yeah. can get muddy. So yeah. equip them with just enough knowledge so that they can engage with the cyber team and cyber functions better because we keep preaching cyber is everybody's responsibility. I think I've seen it on every training module ever to exist. It's like, well, yeah, okay, how do we help them take responsibility? Yeah. I think, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. Even recently, I've seen a couple incidences uh, with a council where it was someone who's not necessarily cyber savvy, but they're critical to the process of uh, they were making payments. And because they weren't, they didn't exactly do their due diligence of checking bank accounts, you know, and this process that's supposed to be in place, um, you know, they, they were almost uh, compromised. Thankfully, they caught it last second. But yeah. it goes to show that those people are the worry ones. It's not necessarily, you know, the cyber people, even though, of course, they're big targets. It's about, uh, you know, the everyday people doing everyday processes that you really need to help educate. Absolutely. Or even um, another example that sort of even removes it from a direct. So that was a, like a payment scam. It's quite direct, right? Yep. Um, people using technology. I think we've sort of skipped over a big batch of people who we just assumed that because they have a computer at work and they know and they use it, they know how technology works. Yeah. But it's not the case, right? Um, I have been an internet user my whole life, so when I see those three vertical lines, you know, on a web page, you know that that's a yep. menu. The, yep. the hamburger yep. yeah, symbol. Yeah, yeah. Right? We know the, these sort of interface things. Um, in a, I've done a little work with project management teams recently and the agile method. Yeah. And it's all about that, you know, outputting, um, well, outputs more frequently, yeah. delivering like more delivery. frequently, not batch being at the end. Right? Yeah. And someone who has worked in it for a very long time made a comment to me about one of the issues they face is that things change so quickly with every reiteration, they may, someone may move a button. And something as simple as moving a button can put up a barrier for customers. And I say customers, you've got external customers, but also your employees as a customer of your product that you're building can get confused. I was like, well, hold on. What am I, how am I using this tool now? You've moved a button, you've changed the interface. I know everyone loved to complain um, when a lot of the tools, I think it's like Facebook went under, went under a massive change or the settings changed, every yeah. interface changed and there was like, how do I use this now? Like my grandpa had just got used to the basics of the first Facebook and then they updated it. Yeah. There's the flaw. 
it's not even about secure use. It's just about use. You can say goodbye to security if someone doesn't know how to use the product as itself. So now we have this agile method. People don't, tools keep changing too quickly. And if we don't really give people the information on how to use it and securely, that's where things start to fall apart. So that's where it's like, well, if we had told people who, or educate people who build an interface to think about this perspective, it may improve their outcomes. Yeah. Okay, I think we touched on it before. Um, how do you think we actually do absorb information better? How do we get these, you know, everyday people and how do we make it sure that they're doing the training but they're actually listening in? So, like, personally, whenever I'm delivering training or doing slides, I try to make it a little more personal so that, you know, I don't, I don't know if you'd call it a scare factor necessarily, but, you know, it makes people realize that it is real and you try to get the audience involved by saying, like, you know, have you ever been scammed before? And, you know, keeping it as an open discussion. Um, what are some methods that you see that work such as that? Yeah, so the methods is all of them. And that's why there are security awareness teams, because every person learns differently. Every person responds differently. So if you think about teenagers when they learn to drive, some of them are so scared of driving because they know the dangers that they're very timid and it takes them a while. Others get behind the wheel and just want to take off and go across pedestrian crossings without looking because they don't take the scare factor like the others do. So when you use the scare, I like I mean, I, when I say the scare factor, we keep saying that and it's the wrong terminology and that I, yeah. you know, I'm the same, I don't like using it, but it's the, it'll explain it enough for now. Um, some will respond well and those who have experienced it or know someone who's experienced it will feel it closer whereas others are just going to turn switch off so can you identify who's who easily absolutely not face to face where they can talk and it's a two-way communication you can actually overcome those obstacles a lot easier online modules you're it's one way right so you're you're shooting in the dark you're you're giving a module that you're hoping will cater to the most amount of people, but we all know how diverse everyone is. So I think the best way uh, or the methods to use is to use a range of methods, um, have a range of options. So for, for people who have organizations who have large programs, you have your online modules that are very, like here's the information, it's very technical or analytical for those who just want to sit and learn behind their computer and may do very well doing that with some scare tactics. You know, here is a video for those who want to learn through a video that's more positive and uplifting and just sort of providing options. Is it a lot of work? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But at the end of the day, what risk are we actually buying down here? Yeah. And is it worth the effort? I mean, let's ask Optus, Medibank, Iconic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we could rattle on, right? Yeah. yeah. I would love to know the hindsight. I don't think you'd ever know unless you're in that company, of course, but, you know, I think there's um, really easy conversations on where to spend money after situations like that happen. Yeah. I mean, I've said it a million different times. Is it doesn't matter if you got the most secure network uh, in the world. If you have employees that are clicking phishing links, something's going to get through. And um, I mean, the ASD report, things keep coming out. The human error continues to be the the biggest vulnerability. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, because people use our systems, right? People modify the configurations, the settings. Someone goes on holiday, someone else takes over. Um, yeah, it's people behind every tool that we've created. I mean, we love automations, but they have to get set up. And exactly. Yep. We need to build them. So absolutely. Just touching back on the sort of agile approach that you are talking about before, hmm. is there a way, do you think, to incorporate cyber into that approach where it's, you know, when they're, pushing a new product or a new feature into a existing uh, application or uh, any yeah. program or anything, do you think that the right way to go about it would be to like have people involved from cyber or from people who are going to know more about accessibility? Like what are, how can, what's in your opinion, what are some ways yeah. that we can tackle the issue of not only changing things that don't really need to be changed, but also making sure that they don't have a cyber impact as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, A, have everyone involved in that process with the baseline cybersecurity fundamentals understanding, right? 
just let them understand the concept. How do attacks happen? Yeah. How do attacks happen in the environment that I'm working with? So that helps. Um, another one is the distribution of that knowledge will help um, bring in the cybersecurity conversation from the beginning and in every review meeting, right? In every sprint. So uh, I know some teams have that capability already or they use, so depending on the project, they might have DevSecOps involved. And so they're already bringing in that lens. Um, but for those who don't, they're like, oh, we need to contact the cyber team. Yeah. Well, we know the cyber teams have a thousand and one things to do and they may not always make every meeting, so they're missing. So we need to empower them to be able to have the security topics tabled at each stage without the cyber team. And when the cyber team can come in, they really enrich that conversation more or they provide the approvals that they need and then they do the work they need to do. Um, but just if the cyber team's not available, that you're not dependent on that. You can have those perspectives and do the project right. Um, one of the other things is know that pen testing most likely will have to be conducted. It has to be done at a certain time because the product has to be ready and it has to be done before it goes live. Otherwise, you end up with a risk acceptance um, on some of those risks or if you haven't done one at all, you're just accepting the fact that you haven't done a pen test. Um, and that window can be very small for some projects, especially if they've had delays along the way and they've got this final window to do a proper pen test and that cyber team can't turn it around in time because it takes time and effort to do. Just by understanding that process, you can plan better from the beginning in those agile ways of working. They're my thoughts to that. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Now, you touched a little bit on diversity uh, a bit before, and it's one of the topics that we've sort of wanted to, wanted to bring up and talk about. How do... Oh, well, also, you've we've seen that you've done some previous work on bringing women into cybersecurity. How do you think that we can entice more women to come into the industry and also empower the ones that are already in the industry? Because there, you know, it's not like there's no women in the industry at the moment. Obviously, there's mm -hmm. you know quite a lot. But how do we empower them to stay and to empower others as well to come in? Absolutely. Um, I think what you're talking about is the tech girls movement, um, yes. and that was a that that one's now concluded. But that was a fantastic program at the time. Um, it it brought together girls in schools. Um, and it was all focused on STEM and it basically gave them a project to build an application, like a mobile application that solves a community problem. And I'm telling you, some of the, the solutions that came out, I'm thinking if these guys haven't got one of those Nobel prizes by the time they're 25, like they're, they're, they were so great. And I just, it was really inspiring because you have these minds where technical limitations didn't exist. Yeah. Because, you know, they are building Some of the apps were actually really functional as well. Like, we're very realistic and they published them on the App Store. Um, but there was no technical limitations and they were able to flourish. And my involvement was just as a coach to help answer some of the questions they may have. Yeah. And to me, you know, I think every kid, as you're growing up, you're influenced very easily by what's around you. And so I love the idea of exposing any child if they have an interest in STEM, giving them that leadership or that just that observation of an adult that they can relate to yeah. in a role that they can see themselves doing. Um, you know, it's like we kids looked up to, or little girls looked up to Barbie because she was everything they thought they could be. So Barbie adapted and did, you know, professional Barbie, tennis Barbie, you know, it's that sort of same concept. And I think for that as well and moving into how do we empower women already in the roles. Mm. Yeah, women empower women we love to chat um we love to you know if i if i look i'm on facebook i'm on a whole bunch of groups on facebook you know where i live community groups and the bulk of the people in that group are women mm. and they love to to they're really open and i feed off that energy so you know when i come across another female um in a in the workplace environment we have a great chat we would connect in a different way that i would connect to my male colleagues and that's really all it is, finding personal connections in the workplace and doing what you can for that person in a way you know that can help them, but recognizing that it's important to help them. And that can really go for anyone, you know, boosting them, giving them a mentor, giving them sponsorship, showing them leadership, um, you know, help having them shadow somebody yep. and kind of see um, just to stop themselves 
for doubting themselves and show, no, you can do this. You know, this person's in that and they had the same obstacles you've had. Um, for me as well, that's very much um, when women go through having a baby. It's very daunting and you forget that, no, no, you can do this. You know, you can enter the workforce after um, just because, you know, you're already sleep deprived. So a lot of those intrusive thoughts might come in and you think, oh, no, I can't do this. It's too hard, but you can. Yeah. It's just about having that role model. And I think role models are important for every type of person. Yeah. Um, I mean, you guys, do you study cybersecurity? Is that, yeah. 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 We were the first trunge of cybersecurity degrees. So yeah. we were fortunate <laughs> enough that we kind of had that guidance. So we had a couple of lecturers that were, um, you know, really on top of it, really good role models, as you said. Yeah. Yeah. So you um, can really read off them. Yeah, exactly. What Just what doing. I'll have to double check the statistic, but I think it was 17, 18% of the industry is women. So it definitely is a major issue. Um, you know, as much as me and Max are different, there's certain things where we're going to have this, a similar perspective, even if it is subconsciously. So it's, it's such an important thing to have people with all diverse backgrounds, just because it does allow for, you know, different perspectives and different solutions because of that. Yeah. I think it's sort of like different ways of problem solving. Exactly. Um, yeah, and that's really key. And um, you do see uh, a lot of females enter the workforce from the soft skill side. Um, yeah, because that's I mean, generally, it's a bit, it is a generalization. The strength that we bring, I certainly bring that strength. I've never been the analytical um, person. I've been the visual, mm. soft skill person. So I can only hope to bring the best that I can, and I learn off the analytical people as well. So um, to say and just for sort of, yeah, yeah, and. So to our audience, you know, we've always said how important the soft skills really are. So if you are that kind of person and you're doubting yourself getting into cybersecurity, there's absolutely a spot for everyone, um, which is the beauty of cyber. It's such a multidisciplinary field that anyone can really do it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so great to hear you guys studied the first wave of actual cybersecurity. You guys have been running rings around what we call seasoned cyber execs at the moment, like <laughs> what we're doing because... It's been a build up of knowledge and you guys will just have such a great streak coming into it. I'm yeah. Really excited for what it's yeah. going to bring, actually. I, I don't know if we would say we, we would run ringers around them just yet, but <laughs> I, I agree that it's, it's <laughs> yeah. I, I agree it's useful having a bit of a like a education background in it because, yeah, it's totally, it's not something that has been a thing ever. So, it, yeah, it's it's useful to have, to have studied it and, you know, be able to apply things that we learned from uni and especially in Flynn's case where he did some research as well um, during uni and, and yeah, bring that into the industry. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. There's a place for everyone. You just have to find it exactly. and persevere with it, um, no matter, yeah, what background you come from, what skill sets you bring. Uh, so we also found that you currently, as you said, are running a business. What is sort of the difficulties you find in, you know, starting up a business or a tool in cybersecurity, what are some of the challenges that you face? Yeah, this is, I love that you asked this question because I was actually talking about this with my husband today, literally today, because I had a bit of an epiphany. Mm -hmm. And I've heard the advice over and over, when you're building a business, you need to have a focus. Yep. You need to have a plan. You need to know where you're going, a mission. Um, the mission for me was easy. That was, the, that was the approachable cybersecurity education for humans. So that was established at the beginning. Um, but despite knowing, and I've set up a business before, so I, I know this concept, I still found myself in a way where I was splitting myself a hundred different ways. And I was trying a hundred different avenues, different approaches, um, different types of business models, but I think that was necessary. So one of the biggest challenges that comes up is finding that focus and not to fret before you find that focus. You have to become a hot mess because that's when you figure out what your priorities should be. And you very quickly realize, oh, this work stream right here is where it's at for me. I'm doing well on it. My skill set is strong here. I have the market and now I have a focus. But to get to that point is where you have to, you got to be passionate because yeah. you have to be a mess and you have, your passion will get you through that mess until you can find that focus. When I say you, some people have that focus from the get-go um, and that, you know, fantastic. That was not me. I did have to run through some, a lot of planning in my head, um, a lot of nights thinking, strategizing, moving things around, saying yes to so many things to figure out 
well, where are my no's and now what am I going to focus on? So yeah. that's probably been the biggest challenge, finding the focus. Right. It's bringing it back to cyber, I suppose it's a bit corny, but even uh, I say to a lot of people that we're doing training on and stuff is that never waste a good crisis. So it's not really a crisis per se, but when things are going bad, that's the time where you learn the most. Um, that's where you really, you know, yeah. learn what works and what doesn't um, and how to move forward. Yeah, absolutely. Because you, you perform under pressure um, and you have to make quick, smart decisions. Yep. Um, were you guys the kind that didn't do a uni assignment until the last minute where you had only a set amount of time? To complete it? Or you- I was the one chasing Max up to start the right. assignment selection. <laughs> hey, you know. <laughs> Where's this coming from, hey? <laughs> I, I was the last minute, last minute person for a reason. I felt like I did my best work at the last minute. And I think that's your concept too, is that when in crisis, you, you think differently. And if you're prepared, clearly. Yeah. And that's good. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say all of my assignments were last minute, but definitely I found a few times when I got to that stage where it was like, oh, you know, shit, this assignment is due in, you know, uh, a day or, you know, uh, yeah. an hour from now. You definitely hit a zone, like where you're, where you're, you know, fully focused and you're just completely, you're only thinking about the assignment. And yeah, some of my best work I think was done, maybe not last minute, but definitely under the... There's a word for this. I just realized it's the fight or flight. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone said to me, it's literally the fight or flight, isn't it? It's the, you, you right. We, you have to fight because yeah. you have a window yeah. and it needs to be submitted by the end of that window. So yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Did you, did you hear about the cyber attack in the Valorant tournament? Oh, not Valorant. Um, Apex, Le- Apex Legends. To, uh, to- Valorant tournament. No, I didn't. There was something interesting just uh, was like last week or the week before. Someone gave was able to hack into the the system they had at a tournament. And someone who was sitting on the stage, they went from just playing normally. Someone like gifted them like wall hacks, so they were able to see people through the walls and you know be able to you know, like physically the tournament that yeah. was where they set up the big and they closed Quite off. Quite sure it was in person. Yeah, <laughs> they searched it straight away. So just on on that topic, how how do you think that you know, uh, I'm st- like we know that you uh, play a little bit of games in your spare time. Mm. Do you have any sort of experience or any ideas for how maybe the gaming industry would um would be able to maybe not stop cyber threats, but some methodologies they can use to uh, be able to I don't know um have a look at cyber as a as an angle that corporate in corporate yeah. we normally normally would. Yeah, so I think it's just acknowledging that. Gaming companies have very different employees yep. for the most part because a large part of it, and this is, this is just about breaking down well, who's in your company, right? And in gaming, you got designers, developers, you bulk of your workforce are people who are into games. Yep. You can't not be. You can't be a game designer and not be into games, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be very good at it. Yep. Of course, you have you know HR, payroll, finance, those functions, but they're smaller. So I think you'd have to really acknowledge their interests and strengths and utilize them so you could put an awareness person in that company who is like me Mm. and if we just did our normal role we wouldn't do very well because it wouldn't appeal to that audience what i would think is get one of those game designers create a bit of a working group do a bit of a passion project where they can create a mini game you know low code nice and easy easy graphics it doesn't have to be you know epic like the games that we see these days um and gamify a cybersecurity course because they're bought in. The buy-in is the biggest part of awareness. If you don't have them, the buy-in is the culture. If you don't have the culture, people don't care. Their culture is the games. So you've, if you've got people who've worked on a game, then their colleagues are going to want to see what they've built and there will be an interest in cyber. That's the first time I've thought of this question mm. and I'm, I think I'm happy with that answer. I hope it would work. I'm not saying it would. You'd have to test it, but... If you acknowledge the audience you're working with, yep. um, I reckon that would that would um, produce the best results. Um, and I have a few friends that actually work in gaming companies. Mm. Uh, I might actually reach out to them after this and see what what yeah, the community strategies are. <laughs> I was going to say it's funny you say that because I actually 
um, had a situation where I was just working on some marketing stuff at work and I thought of that exact idea of gamifying cybersecurity. Um, it never kind of came to fruition because I was trying to do like a web-based sort of like pick your journey sort of style um, and, you know, billables caught up, unfortunately. Yeah. So it never came to fruition. Um, but it, I, it's something that I would love to see someone do. Um, yeah, and I think it was a proper a, game. Yeah. yeah, if it, if somebody could actually properly gamify cybersecurity, I think it would be a game changer. Uh, yeah. Unintended, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, because there's gamifying now, but they're different. They're game, games for the whole workforce. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about games for gamers. Yeah. You know, That's true. we love to jump in. We know how to, okay, I'm going to say we, but I should probably exclude myself from that conversation because whilst I am a gamer, I am not very good. And I ask about a thousand questions every time we game, and I usually repeat the same questions because I'm still getting a hold <laughs> of the whole concept. And it's been a years, by the way, guys. It's been at least five years that I'm still. <laughs> it takes a while. Like when you're up yeah. against people have put in ten thousand hours, you're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> There's just no hope. And especially when the games are a bit older, then yeah. there, there are people who have just you know completely played them nonstop since it came out. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and they just they just dominate. Luckily, they have the rankings that do help. Um, so you're putting yeah. at least with equally played hours, people. But yeah, sorry, that was a tangent. But I would love to see a proper game game. Mm. There was Cyberpunk. It wasn't. I didn't have cyber concepts, but that was a very futuristic game. That was pretty cool. Yeah, there is some like game of fight. I was playing one of some. I think it was called Night Team Four. But it's basically just, you know, a gamified hacking simula simulator. But, you know, how many people are going to be doing hacking stuff? It's not directly relevant, but, you know, it's still cool. People have been trying to do it. But as you said, it's about um, zoning in on your audience and figuring out. Yeah. Uh, There's heaps of gamers ones, but... can't code or hack. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. 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 I I've played I mean... a couple which are a little bit more like, yeah, like Flynn said, like pen testy hacky, but a lot of them aren't super realistic and a lot of them are trying to just you know make you feel like a cool hacker the whole time it's less about that sort of security defense mindset so yeah i think that's something that hasn't really been explored that much yeah that i love that it's that it's that hacking stereotype right with yeah, the exactly. knee behind the computer and i laugh at that every time because in winter my husband's in cyber security as well mm. and when he's coding Guys, he's, got I hoodie on. <laughs> he's got his hoodie on, and, he's <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, he's in the mainframe. <laughs> <laughs> it's a stereotype for a reason. I think that's just, you know, they're usually introverted and that's comfy. I mean, who doesn't love a good hoodie in winter? Yeah, um, yeah exactly. It's the best kind of t shirt canon you can get these days with company swag is yeah. get everyone a hoodie. Yeah, people go crazy for the hoodies. There you go. We've incentivization, company hoodies. That'll work. <laughs> Just uh, another question I had was, so before you started your own thing and had your own business, did you work in corporate before? Yeah. Yeah. So what yeah. was the what was the jump like? And you said that you'd started your own uh, business. Yeah. And it wasn't the first time. But what was the transition actually? Like, how was that like being able to swap, swap from working for someone else to working for yourself? Working for yourself? Yeah. Yeah, really good question, actually, um, because that that's the big the big leap, right? Mm -hmm. yep. The big conversation topic when people are trying to, you know, do a, they do a side hustle and when do they make the jump over to make it full time? Um, for me, I mean, I've done a lot more work in startups over the years, more companies, and when you do that, you have to be involved in everything. You aren't just your role, yep. um, and you have to connect with a lot of people. So when I say I'm a people person, by all facets of the term, I, I like to meet people, I catch up with a lot of people all the time, I talk about what they like, I want to learn about their world. And when you connect so much with so many people, that jump is easier yep. because you have a starting point. You're not just saying, cool, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to make a business, where do I go? You're actually already responding to the market. So that would be my biggest piece of advice for anyone jumping is you don't jump until you have a market. And that might mean you started a conversation with someone, like, hey, there's a piece of work. I could do this piece of work. Of course, I can't do this piece of work whilst I'm working for somebody else. Is this something I think that I could make a future out of? 
and you keep that communication line open. Maybe you talk to a few others and say, hey, if I did this, would this work for you? Yeah, we'd be interested. So talking to people is how I make that jump. I made sure that there was a market Mm -hmm. ready for me when I made that jump. So it didn't feel like a jump. felt like a step over a puddle, I would say. Um, It was a hard decision, though. It was a very hard decision. I will say that because I I really liked um, my workforce um, and all my colleagues. And working in a, you know, large cyber team is exhilarating. You get to see and do a lot. Um, but the stage of life that I'm in at the moment, this just made more sense for me. So, yeah. yeah. Which is not me. But I can imagine it's quite daunting, you know, going from that more, I suppose, secure environment to something that it's all, it's all comes back to you. Um, I can imagine that's quite scary. Yeah, actually, but you've, that's pretty spot on because um, you're responsible for you now. Yeah, exactly. You can't just log off and your brain doesn't switch off with it because. Yeah, it's, it's your own motivation. Where coming from. Yeah, you've yeah. got to really chase it. Um, and for some, you know, will thrive off that. Um, some, is, you know, they'll they'll start it, they'll do it. It's not for them and that's, you know, just their choice and I think that's perfectly fine too. Like we, you have to do what makes you happy at the end of the day. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Christina, for that. It was fantastic having you on. Do you have any closing remarks or closing statements for our, our listeners? Oh, Rather than keep an eye on this podcast, you guys hit your 21, 21 episodes. That's incredible. Um, you have a great conversational tone. Um, you know, all these types of podcasts help people learn. That's how I learned quite a lot, just listening, listening to different perspectives. Um, in a line with what we've spoken about, if my conclusion will be talk to people. Always open yourself up to talk to people. You don't know what it will lead to and how it can um, – help you, help them, help everyone. Awesome. Thanks so much, Christina. We'll chat soon. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Have a lovely evening. You too. Thanks for listening. Just a reminder that the Cyber Minutes podcast is for educational purposes only. The views expressed by hosts and guests are their own, not necessarily their employers. Advice discussed is general advice. We promote ethical discussions, not illegal activities. Have a cybersecurity question? Send an email to cyberminutespodcast at gmail.com as we'd love to answer it. Stay cyber safe.